So again, today's webinar is Intro to Search Engine Optimization, you know, SEO 101, presented by your domain.com team. And, you know, who am I? Who is the folks you're listening to? I'm Michael Hahn, an SEO specialist here with domain.com. And I'm joined here today with Natalie Brownell and Lindsay Bourgeois, who are marketing managers on the marketing team here with me. And breaking down today's agenda, you know, again, as I said before, today's webinar topic is SEO 101. We'll be doing a deep dive into really demystifying SEO. We'll be breaking down what is SEO, how do search engines like Google, Yahoo, Bing, or DuckDuckGo really operate, you know, how do they determine their rankings, and then how can we optimize for them so that we're improving our search engine visibility. If you're unfamiliar with SEO or even, you know, what that means, or you've only just heard of it and don't really understand too much of it, that's really perfect. This webinar was designed with you in mind. And again, we'll be ending today's webinar with some core takeaways and then hopefully have some time to answer your questions. And before we really get into the deck itself, I want to start us off with just a quick poll question. I want to see the overall strength that the audience has with SEO. Um, the poll should be open now. So just take, take a few questions um, or a few seconds to answer that question. Okay, I think that's enough time. I think we can go ahead and share those results. Okay, great. So it looks like for the most of us in the room, um, you know, we've heard of SEO, but don't really know enough to do it ourselves. Um, that's perfect. I really want this deck to be, you know, as actionable for you guys as possible. So breaking down what is SEO. So getting into the basics of search engine optimization. Um, let's start us off with a simple definition. So what is SEO? So SEO or search engine optimization is really just a simple process of improving your website so that search engines like Google or Yahoo serve your web pages in better positions in organic results. So organic search is often called natural search or earned media or unpaid results um, due to their free nature. And when we refer to search engines, again, we're mostly talking about Google. Um, for most of us in this room, we are primarily located in the US. So Google will generally account for anywhere from 80 to 95% of our organic traffic. And when we're optimizing for Google, we really are optimizing for the rest of them. So breaking down the anatomy of a SERP or a search engine results page in SEO vernacular. If you look on the left here, you'll see a screenshot for the SERP of the query by fishing rod. Um, a fishing score will be a central theme in today's deck. Um, now, the first thing we can notice is that, again, there's a lot on this page, right? There is a query at the top of the page that we're all familiar with, and then the typical blue links or the organic links somewhere in the bottom here. Um, but in between, there's a lot of new features stacked in. There are Google Shopping ads, there are the regular text ads. In purple, we have the local SEO results or the SEO or the local SEO carousel. Um, and really, the core big takeaway here is just understand that Google is testing a lot of new search features, uh, even daily, uh, to the minute point of you know, the percentage of results should have you know, XYZ feature in such case. So we'll be breaking down um, some of this evolution of the SERP in a later slide. I want to bring us to a really great study that was done by Nielsen, done um, I think back in 2012, uh, where they broke down more than 1.4 billion searches and queries. And what they found was that in those searches, about 94% of all those clicks went to a organic result. Now, what this means is that even though we had all those PLAs and all those shopping ads and text ads at the top, um, only 6% of clicks actually reach those page destinations. And what that really speaks to is, you know, over the course of time, all of us in the room have really seen enough bad landing pages or bad ads that brought us to a destination that, you know, was either terrible or not what we really thought it was. So 
over time, as users, we've really trained and conditioned ourselves to be chasing after these organic links in particular. Another thing that this link war really speaks to is that it really emphasizes the importance of SEO, right? You know, for us who belong to an organization or a business, um, if we don't have a way to reach our audiences organically, we are leaving a huge stream of traffic and potential revenue right on the table. Another reason why organic results are so important is it gives us a great amount of information about our users and our overall audience. In that same study by Nielsen, they saw that about 72% of users are turning to organic search for their research portion, 89% of consumers are using search engines for purchasing decisions, and lastly, um, at a point that I find really interesting is that 90% of smartphone users are looking for information and not necessarily brands. So these users, especially when we're talking about voice search with Alexa these days, um, people are very brand agnostic. They're really looking for information and things that get them, um, or just the detailed answer they're looking for, and they don't really care where that information is really coming from. Taking a look at organic click-through rate, also called CTR, um, or th that's basically the amount of times your link was able to be clicked and it was actually clicked. Um, so let's take a look at page one results, and this is just expecting us to have 10 organic um, links available. Um, I'll be breaking down the differences between a head term and a long tail term in a later slide, but basically head terms are keywords that have huge amounts of monthly search volume, um, but likewise, that's also paired with a lot of competition. Uh, due to their high volume, they tend to have a bit of an ambiguous nature in their user intent, um, and longer tail keywords are just the opposite. A longer tail keyword use many words as opposed to just one, two, or three, and they help contextualize a query a bit. Uh, due to the number of words they have in there, they're noted for having um, less monthly search volume, but also less competition, so it's easier to rank for. So again, this is the typical CTR curve. Um, they vary from industry to industry, so this is just a general purpose one. Um, but again, the dynamics are basically the same. Your number one position will carry the most amount of weight, uh, meaning that they're going to be getting the most amount of clicks, potentially. Um, and then second and third will be a little bit less. So overall, the top three positions are what we call high traffic positions. Um, they, re they are really our bread and butter positions. Um, this is where most of the clicks for a organic query are going anyway. So when we're ranking for a keyword or searching for keywords that we can rank for, um, finding keywords that we can rank for in these three positions is going to be hugely important to our industry and to our organization. Um, and again, we're talking about page one specifically because I think in that same study by Nielsen, they saw that, you know, less than 1% of people are even making it to page two. Um, you know, Google has done a fantastic job with their algorithms these days. So most of us don't even generally reach page two. Myself personally, you know, as a user, I think I can speak to the fact um, that I rarely go past page two or three. So just a quick review here. You know, SEO or search engine optimization is, again, simply the process of optimizing a website to obtain better results in search engine pages. Uh, and again, organic traffic, also called natural search, is free traffic. We're not paying for any of this. There's no check going to Google at the end of the year. You know, there's no monthly subscription or anything like that. Um, it's really just creating quality pages that Google likes to surface. And again, the importance of having organic um, as a profile within our industry or, or organization you know, 94% of these clicks are going to organic results, not paid results. So how does SEO actually work? So demystifying a little bit um, the search engine and their processes. So <clears throat> now that we've broken the SEO, let's break down search engines. Um, again, when we're discussing search engines, we're primarily talking about Google in the US. Every day, these search engines and their robots and bots and crawlers are crawling billions of pages. Their ultimate job is to crawl these websites and index their pages. Uh, the real magic um, when we're talking about search engines is the search engine algorithm, um, and it's unique to each of the search engines platforms. The idea is they're applying all of their magic, like deep learning, machine learning, AI semantics, you know, all the things that make these guys billion dollar companies. 
And what they're doing is combining all these applications to understand the web page that they're crawling, the root domain that they're on, and seeing if they pass their own unique set of criteria. If they do feel that it passes, they're going to include these pages in their database of index pages. And then afterwards, when a user like yourself or me um, make a relevant query, we're going to churn out all the results in the order that they feel best answers that query. In a really simplified analogy, imagine Google being the head librarian at a massive library. And there are trillions and trillions of books in that library. Google's job as the head librarian is to understand each and every page within those trillions of books so that when I type something into Google, like buy a domain, it's going to go through its huge catalog of books, find all the pages within them that include my keyword or a relevant keyword, and then turn those results back to me. And it doesn't do so in any random order. It gives me the pages that Google feels is most relevant. And you know, with 99% of us never reaching page two, they've gotten pretty good at it. To go into the algorithms in a bit of a, a deeper level, um, we can spend all day on this topic. Uh, the only core takeaway that I want you guys to, um, to really take away here is the fact that Google has not always been as good as it is today. Uh, they've had to go through meticulous decades to be where they are now. Um, you know, and as I mentioned before, every year Google is making these 500 small changes to their algorithm, which is obviously more than once per day. Um, but over the course of the year, they also have two to four broader, much larger algorithm updates. And these changes are really designed to make their algorithm smarter or more sophisticated or faster at bringing us results. Um, and then generally speaking, they also work to combat spammy or generally bad SEO practices. Um, one of the things I wanted to update or highlight would be the Google Hummingbird update, um, where they got particularly good at understanding micro moments. So depending on your own search pattern or, for instance, your geolocation or pages that you've recently visited, Google understands the nuances of a micro moment in a query for like Jaguar, for instance. <clears throat> so with that query, which is a bit ambiguous, you know, are you searching for the cats or the automobile maker? Um, and things like these Google algorithm updates help to understand those micro moments a little bit better. Um, another really important algorithm update that's, you know, in more recent history would be uh, the 2019 update of the medic update, the Your Money, Your Life, where Google put extra emphasis on certain industries. Um, so it's much harder to rank for keywords in financial or medical industries unless you are a true expert and you carry what they consider to be the necessary levels of trustworthiness, expertise, and authoritativeness. And again, I want to bring us back into um, the dynamics of a SERP layout. Uh, oftentimes, these changes to the algorithm that I mentioned before are subtle behind the scene tweaks, helping Google break down and understand content better in their back end. Uh, but sometimes we have something uh, a little bit more visible or tangible to, to, to notice. Um, as with the SERP features that we've noticed. So as I mentioned back in the day, um, the SERP dynamic was much different than it is today. Uh, today it's highly contextual, but back in the day it was not. You may even remember um, they had their little mini navigation on the side uh, back in you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, but what, we, what we're seeing today is just a shift from 10 you know, standard blue links to a very contextual uh, SERP feature written really um, layout today. So breaking down users versus search engines, you know, we mentioned that search engines like to send out uh, their robots or their spider bots to actually crawl the internet. And obviously what these robots are seeing is a little bit different than what you or I would see. Um, so what we see here is just a screenshot on the left-hand side of what a user might expect to see when they land on domain.com's homepage um, versus what a robot might see on the right-hand side. So obviously they don't have eyes in the same sense as you or me. So um, what they see are the little bits of coding, you know, URL names, uh, image names, the metadata, the actual content itself. Um, so it's important that when we're building our website from the ground up, that we're keeping these elements in mind so that we're sending all the right signals to search engines. So just a quick review here, you know, how search engines work. Again, search engines are crawling and indexing pages on the internet, and they return these pages based on specific rankings for user queries which are calculated by their unique algorithms. 
And again, algorithms are just simply advanced formulas and processes used to store and retrieve information. And Google tweaks their algorithm with more than 500 updates per year. And while SERPs have changed, the importance of organic links has not. So we've got into a lot of detail about the individual components of SEO, like search engines and how they work. Let's talk about what those right signals are and how we can win in SEO. So Google has a Raiders guide, which some of you may or may not have seen, is a very, very lengthy guide, um, which details what Google thinks is uh, the components of a strong and healthy website. Um, but generally speaking, we can break it down into five core pieces, and that's going to be your technical SEO, which is asking if users and bots can even access your site and render it properly. Next is going to be relevance. So does the content on our site match the intent behind a queries? So basically, after a query, would a user expect to land on our site? The popularity is really just how frequently are people linking to you, um, which is just you know providing a link that goes towards your domain. You know, how often are they sharing our content in social media? Are they clicking on us in search results? Um, and then what's our reputation? You know, how do people talk about our links? Uh, are anchor texts generally positive or negative? When, does, when they're discussing our brand in social media, are the semantics or, or rhetoric generally positive or negative? And then branding. How does the general population feel about us? What is the quality, you know, of our domain? What's the age of it? And et cetera. And again, when we're talking about winning in SEO, um, there are hundreds of different ranking factors we can analyze, uh, but most importantly, they were not treated equally. There are a few factors that carry much more weight than the others, and that's where I want us to stay focused on today, um, at least in the very beginning, so that we can get the needle moving for SEO. For a lot of us um, who work on SEO, we have to explain, um, or at the very least, you know, provides an explanation for ROI or the impact and the speed of the results. So it's really important for us in SEO to take care of the low hanging fruits whenever possible. So I want to move us on to page titles. Now, page titles are part of on-page SEO. Um, on-page SEO is basically taking care of all the bits and pieces of SEO that are happening on the actual page or website itself. So optimizing for on-page SEO takes care of things like keyword research, the content, the metadata, like page titles, descriptions, headers, canonical tags, and the overall user experience. Now, among these signals I just listed, uh, the page title um, is really one of the most important, if not the most important, and it acts as a short description of a page's content. These page titles are often called meta titles or title tags, and they are located within the head section of our page, as you'll see in this um, snippet here of the code. And they're visible in one of two locations. Um, you can see them in the actual SERP page as the clickable element, um, as you'll see in the screenshot at the top, and as the writing located within the actual tab of your web browser. So think of page titles as one of the first areas that a search engine bot will crawl when they're on a web page. And that page title will help give the search engine robot some clarity and some context on the page's content and purpose. There are a few rules for page titles that I think should be front of mind when you're crafting them. Uh, they should ideally be under 65 characters. Um, you can realistically go over this amount if the bits over the 65 limit are your branding elements. Um, it should also be noted that the character limit isn't the real limiting factor here. Um, we use the character limit as a general gauge, but Google uses character width as the actual measurement. Um, so this means you know, using wider letters such as M or W would take up much more space than say the letter I. I believe you're limited to a 600 pixel limit on, on page titles. And when you're crafting your page title, you should always really be using your primary keyword target in the beginning, uh, since the beginning of the page title actually carries the most weight. Um, this should also um, be unique. We don't want any duplication across our page titles. Uh, beyond the fact that our pages and content should be organized, we don't want them to um, run into any duplication issues where we're using you know, the, the same keywords across a bunch of different pages. Uh, all this really does lead to is truncating our own ranking potential due to cannibalization. We should always be trying to keep our content as organized and as siloed as possible. 
So again, I want this to be as actionable for you guys as possible. Um, so I just provided a couple of just quick in practice basic examples here. I want to provide some examples of what a good page title is and what a bad page title is and the reasons why. Um, the gen so generally speaking, we have our structure up top. Um, this is our structure for general purpose pages. Again, our primary keyword or our most important keyword is going to be in the very beginning. We can follow that up with a secondary and sometimes even tertiary keyword if we have the space for it. We usually append a pipe and then our branding. Um, and again, if that bit of the pipe and the branding goes over the 65 character limit, it's generally not too big of an issue. Um, blog pages are, or excuse me, storefront pages are a little bit different. Um, they're oriented, you know, just product name, and then generally speaking, the product category afterwards, and then the brand name. You know, keyword research actually does help a lot in this. Um, you know, the semantics behind, do we call something a couch or a sofa? You know, there are keyword differences between these two things, jacket, um, you know, or coat. Uh, there are little small differences between these two things and understanding which of the two words that your audience uses is going to be an important part of your keyword research. Um, so as far as good page examples, you know, if we have a blog example up top, um, it might be something to the effect of how to fly fish, beginner's guide, 2021 in brackets, and then the pipe of you know what, whatever my domain would be. So in this case, it's pro mic fishing blog. And an uh, interesting component here would be the 2021 in brackets. Um, all that's really doing is just improving click through rate. Uh, there was a great study done um, by Backlinko which looked into uh, the effects of adding certain elements into your page titles and including the current year in brackets is a great way, especially on evergreen content. Um, to include click through rate on resource material. Now, following this up with a general storefront or front of site page, you know, if fly rods is a specific um, product that we're selling, the category would be fishing rods. And again, ending with our brand name here. Um, I want to highlight the bad page titles example here. So, this first one is an example of just keyword stuffing. So, fly fishing, how to fly fish, fly fishing tips, fly fishing tricks, fly fishing guides, pro mic fishing blog. Obviously that reads terribly, you know, even as a user when we're reading that, that is terrible. Um, and Google is going to catch on very quickly that this is just simply keyword stuffing. Um, and this is going to work against us in the end. The second bad picture example is even though this is very similar to my example up top here, um, the mistake here is appending the brand name in the beginning. Um, that's just a mistake. It's a classic mistake that we see oftentimes. Um, there's no real need to append the brand name in the beginning. Um, you know, your brand name is your domain name, generally speaking. Um, Google has a general, has generally speaking, has a great idea of who you are. Um, so since page titles are weighted very strongly in the beginning, we want to be making sure that we're, we are reinforcing our primary keyword in the beginning of the page title rather than our brand name, which Google should already know. So moving on to the next on-page SEO basic ranking factor, which is meta descriptions. Um, now, it's actually not a ranking factor in of itself, but they actually do heavily influence click-through rate, so it's very important that we optimize them. Um, as we saw before, with page titles being a clickable element in the actual SERP, the meta description is the brief little description on the bottom. So you can either consider meta descriptions to be small little ads for your web page which is why we want to be making sure that the CTA or the call to action is really strong here. Um, and again, the reason why meta descriptions uh, aren't a ranking factor is because over time, um, you can really have us to blame for it. SEOers have been stuffing them with keywords for so long uh, that eventually Google said enough and they deprecated them from the algorithm itself. Now, some general recommendations. We want to be keeping these meta descriptions, um, generally speaking, underneath the 150 to 160 character count. Uh, we want to be making sure that we're using keywords within them. Um, even though they aren't ranking factors in of themselves, you'll notice here that the part of the query um, that's in the meta description will be bolded, um, which is why we want to be making sure that we're using as many keywords as possible in a logical sense. <clears throat> so jumping into some of the meta description basic in practice um, 
behaviors here. So up top, we have our general structure. There's no real general structure that I want you guys to follow. Um, as long as we're using keywords within the actual meta description and there's a strong call to action, um, I'm more than happy with anything that you guys would put up here. Um, I want to provide some examples centered on fly rod or fly rod combo here with that serve, you know, 12.1 thousand monthly search volume or 2.9 thousand respectively. So a good meta description, and again, this is just on the fly, uh, might be something along the lines of shop from the largest selection of fly rods featuring your favorite premium and affordable fishing gear brands, find your perfect fly rod combo today. Now, some bad examples. The first one is when a meta description is missing. So when you don't tell Google what the meta description is, um, they will serve whatever content is on that web page itself. So this is a real example. Um, if you typed in fly rod, you may find this domain. Um, they did not list a meta description, so Google pulled their navigation um, and their filtering elements into the meta description. So this is what you would see underneath their page title. And obviously, this looks terrible. Um, and I will say, this is even maybe even a lucky example. I've seen um, cases where the meta description is being pulled from the legal elements of a product page. So yeah, we, we never really want to see that happening. Um, and again, uh, the second example here is once synonymous with boring pastimes, fishing has become a growing trend among millennials. Enjoy a refreshing fishing experience with us. Now, this may not seem bad in of itself, uh, but the real issue here is that they're not using any of the keywords. Um, that's a common mistake in meta descriptions. Uh, they're not using the primary keywords. Uh, again, the query element will be bolded within the meta description. So, the lack of seeing anything bolded here, you know, a user would see that and say, maybe this content doesn't speak to what I need. And, you know, you're, you're leaving traffic on the table with that. The next element I want to cover are um, header tags. So on header tags are on page HTML tags. Um, they're inserted throughout the body of a web page as opposed to the head, like meta description and page titles. And they're primarily used to help organize the content of a page. Um, they're used by search engines to really identify and understand the most important elements of each section. They range from H1, the most important, to H6. Uh, but realistically speaking, you would have a really hard time reaching anything past H4, unless we're talking about really in-depth blog articles or research papers or buying guides or something analytical like that. Um, you can have multiple H2s to H6s, but there should only be one H1. And people oftentimes confuse the H1 with the page title. Um, and that's, you know, I understand that. They both reinforce um, the page's content and provide context to the overall page. The key differences are in the overall SEO weighting and where they appear. As I said before, header tags are elements on the web page itself. They're located in the body. So page titles can't be seen on the page itself. They're only visible in the SERP element and on your tab information. Whereas H1s should be the biggest, boldest um, text on the web page itself. Now, you should be able to view, or generally you should view the H1 as kind of the supporting act behind the page title. Um, you can use the same primary keywords, but ultimately the H1 and the page title should be unique from each other. Usually speaking, in articles or blogged uh, articles, the H1 is going to be the article itself. So I have an example here from our blog. Um, our blog topic is how to perform a website audit. So you can see in the source code here, the H1 element um, is, is located here. Uh, we have our body text here, and then we have an H2 at the bottom here. So in practice, uh, here's what we might or here's how we might organize some header tags. Um, so this is a page that focuses on, you know, fly rods as a blog article. Again, the H1 should be the article title itself. So speaking to our earlier example, Fly Fishing Rods 101, Complete Beginner's Guide 2021 would be our H1. Excuse me. Um, and then we go down to help categorize uh, some of the information. So our H2, you know, a healthy category would be fly fishing gear and equipment. Underneath that, to explain it a little bit further, we might have an H3 that says premium fly fishing rods, followed by um, fishing gear brand one. Um, an H3 afterwards would be affordable fly fishing rods, followed by 
fishing gear brand two, and then so on and so forth as you go through the different elements on that page. So no matter what though, you know, we've been discussing a lot of on-page SEO elements and what's most important or not. Um, ultimately in SEO, content is king. Uh, we can get as creative as we like with keywords and keyword targeting, um, but unless we have the material that's relevant to that keyword, we shouldn't expect to get organic traffic. Um, as I said before, you know, when we're creating our content, do, do should we expect our audiences to even reach our page given their query? So we should start our content creation with the idea of who is my target audience and what are they looking for? Um, in this little example here, we have you know, an example of a regular persona or an audience and the different questions we might have at different stages of the buying funnel. So the top of the funnel, when they're doing the most research, um, they may have different questions than say um, a user at the very bottom of the funnel. So, you know, if we're talking about a small business owner, for instance, um, and they have three questions at three different stages of bringing their business online. Um, at the top of the funnel, their questions may be something like, how do I bring my small business online? And afterwards they have a question like, what e-commerce features do I need? Followed by, where do I post my new online store? And to help answer those questions, we would need to have things like at the top of the funnel, how to start an online store, in the middle of the funnel, things like e-commerce platform tools. And then finally, at the very bottom of the funnel, when they're asking, where do I host my new online store? If we have a page that chases after things like online store hosting. And all of these different components make, a, make up a solid content plan and content strategy. So again, um, when we're choosing targeting keywords, we need to first run it through our filters. You know, for our keywords, are they relevant? Uh, do they speak to the right user intent? Are the keywords realistic or attainable for us? Um, and is there enough search volume to justify even going after that keyword in the first place? And we're talking about justifying uh, the keyword search volume, we end up running into the question of chasing after head terms versus long tail. Um, as I touched on before, Head terms are those keywords that are generally speaking one to two words in nature. They carry the most amount of search volume, but that's coupled with the most amount of ambiguity and the most amount of competition. Take for instance, the example of a keyword like email, which has 1.2 million searches every month. But the word itself, email, is, is really ambiguous. When someone's typing that into Google, you don't know if they're looking for a way to access their email account. You know, simply is it Gmail that, that they're looking to go to? Or is it, are they looking to create a new email account? Are they looking for email marketing services? Are they looking for email marketing software? Um, you know, 1.2 million is great and we would love to see all of that go into our, into our domain. Um, but realistically speaking, um, the intent is just so ambiguous that even for larger corporations, um, it's just unrealistic and generally speaking, poor SEO. That's why we have, you know, long tail keywords on the flip side of head terms. You know, long tail keywords have much less um, impression volume or keyword monthly search volume, but that's paired with higher um, amounts of intent, more nuanced intent, uh, less competition, um, you know, so as opposed to just email thing, a keyword like email marketing, which only has 18.1 thousand, which is still sufficient, um, is much more, focus, let's say, in, in terms of keyword intents. And then a much longer keyword, such as email marketing campaigns for small businesses. Now that's very, very um, contextualized and very, very focused in its intent. Um, you know, for a query like that, we would expect the users to be much more qualified for a storefront or front of site page. A great solution to making sure that everyone beyond just the SEO or itself um, is kind of aware of you know, the importance of SEO um, and really making sure that all the teams are kind of aligned across the board is going to be the content brief tool. Um, a content brief is very, very simple. All it does is it's this piece of paper created by your SEO team, um, which designates all the important elements of a new web page from the ground up. It keeps all the teams aligned on what you expect the page title to be, the meta description, those header tags that I mentioned before, um, the SEO should be advising on the overall URL structure, and of course, the target keywords and the questions the content is going to answer. 
Um, all this really does help with, again, is just syncing with your broader teams. It keeps all the teams aligned with the importance of SEO, it helps reduce the actual time it takes to create the content, um, and it keeps everyone aligned on what the SEO goals are. And I want to break up the deck here with just another quick poll. Um, and that question is, how often do you update your keyword strategy or your keyword list? Is it semi-annually, monthly, bi-weekly, or rarely slash never? Okay, great. So just viewing some of the results here, it looks like just under 70% of us rarely or never touch it um, with another mixture of us, 15 in semi-annually, 15 in monthly, and 3% in bi-weekly. Um, that's about what I expected from um, the audience scores in the beginning. Um, we want to be updating our keyword list as um, really bi-weekly is a little bit too often, in my opinion, to be updating your keyword list in terms of your actual targeting. I think bi-weekly to kind of update your performance and your rankings is, is not so bad. Um, SEO takes some time to see results. So if you're going to be changing your the nature of your keyword targeting um, you know, on a bi-weekly cadence, uh, you would never actually see the fruits of your labor before you actually change, um, change Google what the purpose is. So generally speaking, looking at your, um, your rankings bi-weekly is no problem. On an actual update cadence, I would say something along the lines of, you know, every two to three months, you should be looking at where you are and then, you know, based on what your goals were and then see if you need a change of strategy from there. Going into internal linking. So internal links are simply links that go from one page on your domain to another page on the same domain, um, as opposed to links that go to a different domain which are called external links. Um, we are not very creative in the SEO world. <laughs> um, now, these internal links are used by users and crawlers to navigate and understand site architecture. Um, these links really just help establish the site architecture for search engine bots. It establishes the relationship between these two pages. So, um, you know, Google would have questions of why you're even linking to these pages in the first place. Um, are they um, topically related? Are they semantically related? You know, what's the purpose here? And if the relationship is understood and it's clear and it makes sense, some authority is created there. So not only are you providing a nice passageway for users to kind of go through your overall site navigation architecture, you're also establishing some SEO equity there as well. Um, the general recommendation for internal links, um, it really needs to be a part of your thinking and, and strategy uh, from the ground up. When you're creating content, you should be thinking in the back of your mind, you know, what great content do I already have? Uh, that I can link to when I'm creating this piece of content. Um, and then from there, we want to be funneling our users into relevant areas of our site. An example from here, you know, this is from our blog. Uh, we created a great dropshipping article. Um, and then, you know, obviously from there, we're going to be linking towards our website builder um, and then some other articles that are centered on, you know, starting your own business online. So we looked at the internal link itself. Um, anchor text is another important element of that. Uh, anchor text is the bit of text that actually establishes that link um, from one page to the next. So from the example page um, or the example from the previous page of how to start an, an online business, that text of how to start an online business that is the link itself is the anchor text. Now when Google, as I mentioned before, is establishing that relationship between two pages, it's scanning the anchor text for the context of that relationship. So when we're creating anchor text, it's always important to be using our best keyword possible um, for the context of that anchor text. And uh, we want to be optimizing, but don't be over optimizing. Um, again, there is a fine line uh, in, in SEO between optimization versus over optimizing. Um, you know, a great tip would just be read it yourself. You know, if it, if it reads funny to you, it's going to read funny to Google. Um, long past are the days of saying things like optimize, optimize for search engines. That's not really a thing anymore. 
Um, generally speaking, that's a bad SEO tactic. Uh, Google, as, as I said before, is very smart these days. And when you're writing for users, just understand you're writing for search engines as well. Now, um, one of the final components of great SEO is technical SEO, uh, which refers to optimizing the technical elements so that your website is able to be crawled, indexed, and rendered properly. You know, there are so many components that go into technical SEO that's actually going to be the topic of our next webinar. Um, we're going to be covering everything from, you know, JavaScript to CSS optimizations, the page load speed, and how that plays a role in your overall ranking factors, you know, different status codes from 200, 300, um, you know, 301, 302, 307 redirects to 400 type of errors, 500 level server errors, um, the importance of site architecture, the robots TXT, uh, and really the list does go on. Um, this will be the topic of our next webinar. It's unfortunately too much to cover in just one deck. Great. So now overall, as we've reached the end of our SEO deck here, um, you know, there was a lot to cover, obviously. Um, almost too much for any one person. You know, for a lot of us who are in SEO itself, um, it, it may be manageable. Um, for, but for a lot of us who wear a lot of hats within our organization, you know, you're not only the SEO, you're also the marketing, you're also the dev. Um, you know, we may not have the time. Um, and it's important to remember that domain.com is here to help you. Um, we've recently launched our SEO solutions tool in the back end, which is available for purchase. Um, to thank you all for joining us in our Hallmark first webinar, we've included a 20% off uh, discount code. It's applicable towards not just um, SEO solutions, but any of the add-on products. Um, there are a few exceptions, um, but basically the new SEO solutions tool is just an easy way to track and manage your optimizations. Um, we provide some detailed SEO roadmaps and planning that are tailored to each of your websites. And overall, it's a great hub to monitor your website traffic, your keyword rankings, and your overall site link um, backlink profile. And that about wraps up today's webinar. I want to end us with um, one more quick poll, which is centered on you guys. You know, what are you guys interested in learning in future webinars? Um, is it, you know, more about quick SEO tips, so things you guys can just watch and take away, um, you know, actionable items in, you know, 30 minutes or so, or is it about technical SEO, which will, which will be the next topic? Um, would you like to learn more about SEO tools? Um, there are some great free tools you guys, you guys can start utilizing immediately, um, or is it on local SEO, so tactics for brick and mortar stores? Great. <clears throat> so the poll is closed now. Um, okay, so generally speaking, it looks like most of us want to take away some quick SEO tips uh, with a lot of us looking to get more information on SEO tools. Um, that's perfect. Um, I'll definitely keep your feedback in mind um, when we're formulating the next webinars. Great. Um, I think we have some time for questions. Um, let me go through your questions and Let's see if I can make sure that we can answer your questions. Great, so one of the first questions I have here is from Adrian. What are some differences between your tools and the SEM Rush? Um, Adrian, fantastic question. There are obviously some differences between an enterprise level you know, SEO tool versus a personal one like SEM Rush. Actually, I find SEM Rush to be a fantastic tool. Um, your only real differences between, you know, the different tiers are going to be um, 
really just the level of ease. Um, I find that a lot of the freer tools have uh, more archaic uh, user interfaces and they're a bit uh, more limited in the number of keywords you can track and things of that nature. But overall, a basic SEO free tool, um, like SEM Rush, is going to provide all the right information um, for monthly search volume and everything. It's the only real differences are the number of keywords you can track. Um, you know, maybe some tools present the information in a bit of a nicer format. Um, but there are no actual differences in the information you're getting. Another question here is from Catherine. Did you say the page title should be different than the H1? So yes, um, that's a great question. Even though they are pretty much serving the exact same purpose, uh, they should be unique from each other. Um, you should really be viewing the H1 as a supporting actor to your page title, where the page title, again, carries your, you know, your primary keyword, it provides context on the page landscape itself or the page context. And then the H1, it can use the same primary keyword. Um, just make sure that it supports the page title. Great. Um, can you get a copy of the deck itself? Um, I'm actually not too sure if we're providing the deck, but you should be able to get um, a copy of the recording and all the resources that are available in this webinar. Adrian also asks, why brackets in our page title? Uh, there was a great study done by Backlinko, um, which took into account a ton of different web pages. Um, and they found that playing around with certain elements on the page title can help promote click-through rate. So including the year or the current year in your brackets helped promote um, click-through rate. So that, that's, that's the only purpose there. You know, in 2022, we're going to be changing those 2021 brackets to 2022. Let's see here. Um, Morgan asks, does all of this info translate to having an Etsy shop or a personal website? So absolutely. Um, unfortunately, I'm not too sure about the dynamics of a Etsy shop, but SEO is going to be supremely important for all of us who have an e-commerce store um, or an online store. Um, you know, making sure that we have great SEO is a great way for people to actually find our website in the first place. Um, making sure that we're optimizing elements like meta descriptions and product descriptions and all that will help to promote, um, you know, actual conversion rate as well. And let's see, another question is, how can we see the results of our organic search on our websites? Um, so a great free tool is Google Analytics, which helps to kind of break down the amount of traffic we're getting from different uh, channel streams. Um, Google Analytics is free, I believe. So you should be able to link that to your website, no problem. Um, I highly recommend it. It's going to be a great center for just monitoring your performance. Beyond that, you know, um, there are a variety of free tools out there that help to break down your overall organic profile. So, you know, um, even things like Screaming Frog or you know, SEM Rush Ahrefs, they provide uh, free trial versions of their tools. Uh, you know, if you type in your domain into those tools, they should all, um, generally speaking, give you a pretty solid profile of where you are at in terms of organic search. They'll provide you with all the organic keywords your domain is ranking for, in what position, uh, you know, how much monthly search volume do these keywords get, what's the competition around them. Um, and all this information helps you kind of narrow down what your targeting keyword strategy should be. Great. Uh, another question is, if your property is selling different brands, should the title include both brand name and property name along with my keywords? Okay, so to bring you into that example, um, let me just go ahead here into what I mean by brand name here. So if you, so as I showed you in my example here, if my website is promikefishing.com, that's what I mean by the brand name. I don't mean the brand name of the um, of the product itself. So what should populate here isn't Nike, if you're selling Nikes. Um, the only time you should see the pipe Nike at the end is for Nike itself. So your property name, Adrian, should be going in the back end here. And as part of your product or product category, that's where your branding should be. So if you're selling Nike shoes, for instance, um, you know, you might have your, 
the exact product name of, of, your, of the Nikes here, followed by you know, Nike runner shoes as the product category. And Ray asks, generally speaking, when hiring someone to create a website, do I have to inquire if they use SEO concepts or is that a given with web developers? Um, you know, I would love for that to be a given, Ray. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it may not be the case. Um, you know, I, I can't give a blanket answer here. Um, unfortunately, that'll have to be just some due diligence on your end. Um, generally speaking, web developers should have the core SEO concepts in mind. Um, most developers these days do have the basic framework, at least for SEO in mind, um, but that is not always the case. Um, when you're looking to work with a web developer or hire someone to create a website, um, it's kind of important, I, I guess, again, it's, it's going to have to be due diligence, I guess, on your end when you're hiring them um, to make sure that they're keeping these uh, topics front of mind. And again, you know, you can work together with them. That's always important, you know, working together with your teams to make sure, um, you know, if it's, even if it's as simple as using something like the content creation brief that I explained in this deck, um, just so you guys are all aligned on the keyword um, targets or, you know, the monthly search volume or the questions you want your content to answer. Great. Um, going through the rest of your questions here. John Rigotti asks, how do I add stuff like meta tags? Do I need to access my website coding? And then can I add this? Will also, will this potentially mess up my coding? Um, Generally speaking, these meta tags that, that I discuss are, are pretty um, non-intrusive coding elements. Um, as, as I explained in my screenshots here, or showed in my screenshots, they, you know, even a non-coder could be adding elements like this. Um, and you don't actually have to be coding it like this either. Um, if you are a current customer with us, John, there is a knowledge base article um, which speaks to actually updating the tools. Um, but generally speaking, all of your content management platforms should have a section just to edit all these basic SEO elements. Um, all the platforms have a section for page titles, meta descriptions. Um, some of them may have it for canonical tags, um, but all the proper or all the, um, the major ones should be um, editable. So uh, Fergus asks, is keyword strategy essentially a matter of including specific keywords or does one have to employ external services to get a search list? Um, so that's, you know, creating a keyword strategy definitely does not require you to hire anyone or, you know, employ an external service. Um, all you really need is just one keyword, one free keyword research tool. Uh, if you have Google AdWords, there is a great tool within it called uh, Google Keyword Planner. And it'll actually give you a everything from what the current monthly search volume of a keyword is to even the, hist the history of it over the past year. So on, on a month to month basis, um, do certain keywords experience seasonality or, you know, or, or not? Um, and then from there, your strategy should be looking at it from a realistic level. You know, is it realistic for us to chase after a word like email? For most of us, probably not, um, which is why we have to get into the uh, more nuanced, longer tail queries like email marketing software or email marketing services. Um, one, one thing I do, I do want to highlight on top of that, Fergus, is um, when we're creating our keyword strategy, I think it's really important for us to not create a list of, you know, 100 to 200 different keywords that we think fit with our business. Um, I think for most of us, it's going to be a bit more, um, a bit more realistic even, um, just to kind of find you know the five to ten keywords that are 
really, really um, central to our organization, to our business, to you know what we sell, um, and then work from there. Um, I would rather have us, you know, try to chase after five keywords and, and kind of get within target distance of it than chasing after 200, 500 keywords and we're all on page, you know, five or six and we're not realistically speaking, getting any traffic there. Let's see. Um, I think for the most part, that answers most of our questions. Um, if I didn't get to your question, I do apologize. Um, I'll, be going, I'll be going back through this question, um, these questions later, and uh, emailing you the answers to any of the ones that I missed. Perfect. Well, again, thank you all for joining us on you know today's domain.com um, webinar. I look forward to presenting the technical SEO with you guys next. Um, and again, if you have any you know, feedback, definitely feel free to, um, I guess, expose me in the next uh, webinar. Thanks, guys.